Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast of the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today on Exegetically Speaking is Dr. Joshua Jipp, who's Associate Professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Joshua, joining us from Chicago. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you, David? Doing okay. It's a little bit warmer here than probably where you are. (laughs) Yeah. Well, sometimes when I hear like one bird chirping out there, it feels like spring in Chicago in January. So. One bird, yes, yes. One bird, that's all it takes. <laughs> that's all it takes. <laughs> hey, you've written a terrific book, The Messianic Theology of the New Testament. We're going to be talking about that on another podcast, the Stone Chapel podcast. But today I want to talk with you on Exegetically Speaking about uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, and particularly the, that into Christo uh, thing. But, yeah. but before that, how did you get started reading Greek? Yeah, well, I I went to a public high school and was taking my faith seriously, got really interested in theology and the Bible and so forth. And I remember doing a campus visit at Northwestern University in St. Paul, Minnesota, sat in on a couple of classes. I just couldn't believe, wow, what are these people doing here? Studying, (laughs) reading, learning Greek. And I love the Bible. And you know, forget these state schools like that. Just, that just sort of sucked me in and wow. I majored in biblical studies and ancient and classical languages. And it was really there that I was able to learn Greek and start reading well, and Hebrew, start reading the scriptures in their original languages. And I often say it was one of the best things I ever did. So, yeah. Terrific. Well, we want to encourage other people to follow you in that. Absolutely. Well, what are we what are we into in, in Ephesians one twenty? What what's happening and what's significant about that passage? In particular, we're going to look at verses twenty through twenty three, mm-hmm. but we we can't in a brief time parse it all out. But tell us about that little phrase into Christo. Yeah, sure. Well, the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, is dominated by a person that he refers to as Christos. I think my count was there are about 46 occurrences oh, in six okay. chapters that are referring, of course, to Jesus of Nazareth as Christos. And so one of the questions right away then is, cool, is that just Jesus' second name? All right, my name's Josh Jitt. His name is Jesus, is Jesus Christ. Or... <laughs> And his, and his mother was Mary Christ, right? There you go. Now, now we just keep moving on reading the text. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or do we do we notice that actually Christos, whether we're looking at the, the Greek scriptures or we're seeing as a translation from what we get in the Hebrew, is referring to usually a royal anointed figure that comes from the house of David that is basically God's elected agent to accomplish his will and his purposes on earth. Mm. And we, you know, we have a choice to some extent to make it simple. Is it a name or is it a title, an honorific that sort of like designates a particular office or function that Jesus himself embodies and lives into? Mm. And I think the weight of evidence in Pauline scholarship, people argued for the name for a long time, but there are good reasons now, and Ephesians 1, 20 and following gives us good reasons to, I think, actually think Paul is using this as not just a second name for Jesus, but as a title. Probably better translated than not just as Christ, but something along the lines of Messiah. Yeah, so in the Messiah. And the Greek word Christos comes from a root, right? Chriseo, which means something like I anoint. Right. The translation that I worked on uh, for a while was called The Voice, and whenever we found that particular word, we would say Jesus the Anointed. Right. That's the way we did it. And in some cases, we glossed it to try to, you know, with the phrase liberating king, the king who liberates and and such. But, But Jesus the Anointed, Jesus the Anointed. Right. I think if you're not if you're not going to translate as Messiah, like anointed does it as does it nicely as well. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there there are other figures in the scriptures that are anointed, but certainly the Messiah or the King spoken of as one who was elected by God, made sacred, made holy mm-hmm. by this sacred act of anointing with oil. And 
you see in the period of the kings, First Samuel and so forth, with Saul right away and David and so forth, where the spirit comes upon them, they prophesy and so forth. They are sacred so much so that David can't still, you know, can't kill Saul because they right. have been marked out as holy and anointed. So absolutely. This one is the Lord's anointed, right? So yeah, exactly. I can't yeah. can't touch him, can't even cut a little piece off of his garment right. when he's in the cave and relieving himself, as I recall, what, he, what he's doing yep. there. So what is it about this particular passage that sort of leads you to think this is not just a name, but it's a title for Jesus? Yeah, I think it's helpful to not, so as that we don't overread it and just say, here's a flow, full-blown messianic theology. Every time we see Christos, it's got all of this and that there. Yeah. That we're able to basically look for some contextual features mm -hmm. that might cause us to say, I think the author, I think in this instance, Paul, intends for us to see there to be some kind of messianic theology in this text. I'll give you a couple real quickly. Maybe I can think of three right away off. Okay the top of my head. One is frequently in Ephesians, God acts in or by means of the Messiah, just as he mm. often does in the Old Testament. God accomplishes his purposes through a particular agent. And so when we get this little prepositional phrase, these there are a lot of prepositional phrases, but in our text, it's ento Christo. It's saying God is acting by this messianic king or by this messianic agent. Mm. We don't have time, I know, to go look through all of these little phrases. But if you look at these little phrases, you'll see this is cons God accomplishes redemption in the Messiah or by means of the Messiah. Mm. On and on, you'll see this is Paul's way of speaking, mm. number one. Number two... You have, even though the texts are not cited with any kind of gagraptai language of as it has been written, mm. Psalm 110 and Psalm 8, especially Psalm 110, certainly stands behind some of the phraseology and language that Paul is using as he then goes on to speak of him being seated at the right hand of, of the Father. He's exalted right. above every ruler and power and authority. Yeah. So I think if you can find, well, there are these royal messianic texts or some kind of Israelite royal ideology from the scriptures that are being applied to this Christ figure, you're on better ground in terms of seeing some messianic mm -hmm. significance there. And then the third and last one, I guess I would say quickly would be, you know, Paul is basically articulating his messianic gospel that he articulates in other places. Here it's emphasizing resurrection, enthronement of mm -hmm. the Messiah, victory over the powers, the relationship that then, that then goes on to establish with his body as he himself is the head. Mm -hmm. And so from other places what, where Paul is very clear about the messianic significance of Jesus, Romans 1, 1 through 5, for example, we see that same kind of mm -hmm. messianic story or narrative being articulated in these, in these verses. Yeah. I, I love the way that you're, you're looking at these texts, reading and pulling these things together, particularly as they sort of expound upon Old Testament images and themes. But uh, yeah. Dr. Jip, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to Silvio Vasquez, Rebecca Larson, and Krista Sanchez for helping us to produce this podcast. Thanks as well to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, the best place you could do that is Wheaton College. They have an amazing program, one of the best I've ever seen, whether you want to be a graduate or an undergraduate student. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for modern and classical languages and get started today. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening. <laughs>